Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Holland. I'm Associate Dean for the Arts here at Notre Dame. And every year, uh, I organize the Saturday Scholars Series. Uh, Christina Walbrecht is Professor of Political Science, and she's the director of the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy and the Mr. and Mrs. C. Robert Hanley Director of the Notre Dame Washington Program. Uh, I still not quite gathered from her how you direct a program in Washington from here, but I'm sure she spends a lot of time in the air toing and froing. Uh, she studied at, uh, her PhD at Washington in St. Louis uh, and came straight from there to Notre Dame, uh, rising through the ranks until uh, in 2017 she re reached the rank of full professor, uh, and we are very, very proud of her career here and looking forward towards the future. She is an expert on American political parties, on gender and politics and political development. She's the co-author with Kevin Corder of Counting Women's Ballots, Female Voters from Suffrage Through the New Deal, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, uh, which received the American Political Science Association's Victoria Shook Prize for the best book on women and politics. And somewhat earlier, in 2002, she published The Politics of Women's Rights, Parties, Positions, and Change with the University of Princeton Press, as well as numerous journal articles uh, and uh, chapters in book collections on topics including women as political role models and the partisan politics of education policy. She's currently co-authoring a book on the first century of women as voters in the United States. We deliberately timed having a talk connected with the midterms until after the midterms in order that we could look back rather than forward and given the tension surrounding the midterms I think it was a wise decision so I'm very pleased to invite Christine Walbrecht to come up and talk about was women's suffrage a failure? Uh, the real reason it was scheduled like this was I knew that you want to come on the last home football game when it's so cold that people just think, I am willing to listen to a college professor for a little bit of time to warm up uh, before I go outside for this game. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for taking some time out of your football Saturday uh, to come uh, and listen to me talk a little bit about this research. I am going to mostly uh, be telling you about some of the research I and my collaborator have done on women voters immediately after suffrage, but I have already given at least two talks about women in the midterms, and I toss those slides in at the end, so if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. So as... Um, Professor Holland kindly said, um, the research I'm gonna talk about today was published in a book two years ago uh, called Counting Women's Ballots, Female Voters from Suffrage Through the New Deal, in which my co-author and I were trying to understand how women voted immediately after suffrage, and I'll talk in a few minutes about why 100 years after this, we actually still don't know much about how women voted after suffrage, and I will, of course, give full credit to my collaborator, Kevin Corder, uh, who is you know, my full partner on this research and on the book that we are finishing this weekend. Um, so I have to get out of here and get back to my computer. Um, as you're probably aware, the struggle for women's suffrage took more than 70 years in the United States. Uh, a number of states passed uh, amendments to their constitutions or laws that allowed women to vote. Uh, I have this picture up of Oregon because that's my uh, home state. Um, but yet it was a really sort of long struggle and I'd be happy to talk later about why it took so long and why there was so much opposition to the idea of women voting. The success at the national level and therefore across most of the United States takes place in 1920 when Congress passes and the President signs the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. That amendment, in case you can't read it, uh, says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Um, in theory, then, enfranchising all women. Now, the reality of that's gonna be very different. In the same way that uh, Jim Crow in the South kept uh, African American men uh, who had been enfranchised by the 15th Amendment uh, unable to vote there, we're gonna see that same sort of dynamic. And so it really won't be until 1965 that most African American women um, are, are able to enjoy the rights uh, provided them in the 19th Amendment. 
So my gosh, we just enfranchised half the population. This is one of the biggest extensions of voting rights, certainly in American history, uh, but in uh, around the world as well as part of sort of a wave of uh, extensions of suffrage. What are women going to do, right? What is, what is going to happen? So this is a normal, Norman Rockwell picture, uh, you can't see, but the woman is uh, holding a picture of Harding and the man has a newspaper with Cox. So Harding was the Republican and Cox was the Democrat uh, in 1920. So lots of talk about this, right? Anticipation and, and preparation. One of the big issues was how women would actually be registered to vote. So you've got women will aid registrar, state obstacles to women's vote loom. The problem was during this period, a lot of states had pretty uh, restrictive voting rules, uh, including very long periods uh, for voter registration. So in many states, you had to be registered to vote a full six months advance of the election. The 19th Amendment was signed by President uh, Wilson, Wilson um, on August 26, 1920, uh, which meant there were only about five, six weeks before uh, that first presidential election in 1920. A number of states found easy ways to do this. The state legislature passed a quick little law that said we're gonna have these open days for women to register. But actually in four southern states, uh, women did not vote in the 1920 presidential election because their state legislatures basically said the deadline was back in the spring and you missed it, sorry. Uh, we'll see you in 1924. Uh, all right, so there's efforts to register women, uh, and then groups that wanted to make sure women could vote. In particular, a suffrage organization that had transformed themselves in the League of Women Voters. Um, they would hold uh, practice elections at state fairs. There was one in a, a department store in New York City, all to sort of give women the opportunity to see what it is you do behind that curtain when you go and vote. How do you fill out a ballot, uh, et cetera? Uh, so this article here is about uh, the Minnesota State Fair, Women Learn How to Vote at Fair. Uh, the Bridgeport, Connecticut Sunday Post had a whole ongoing series of trying to teach women how to, to vote. Uh, this is one of my favorite. It's a joke, but not really. Uh, you can't drag your husband into the booth when you vote Tuesday, and there are no mirrors inside. Uh, your friend or hubby cannot legally offer you a new ho hat to vote for his candidate. By the way, I actually, well, I think your husband could probably buy you a new hat. But, um, and of course, the parties organize uh, around this as well, right? So there's this new group in the electorate. There's a lot of uncertainty about how they're going to vote. And so Democrats lay plans to snare women's votes. That's the Chicago Tribune. Uh, this is a, a button. Harding Coolidge, the straight Republican ticket. Under the 19th Amendment, I cast my first vote, right? So everyone's trying to sort of figure out how women are going to vote. How do we get into the winning uh, elect to the polling places? How do we make sure that they know what to do, uh, et cetera? But there was also a lot of uncertainty. So in virtually every election, uh, after suffrage was granted, there would always be stories. This is the year. Have you seen this long lines of women registering to vote? They, we're going to have so many women registering to vote that they're going to outnumber men. Women will not outnumber men as voters uh, until 1964. Uh, and at that point, they still voted at a lower rate than men did, but there are more adult women. And so the numbers of women was greater. It won't be until 1980, uh, 60 years after the 19th Amendment, that women will vote uh, as a, at a higher rate than do men uh, to this day. So women filled lines. Women take the ballot seriously. But politicians on the other column here are very worried. And they have all these ideas, right? Women are more flaky. They're not as low loyal. We're, they're all emotional. We, maybe they'll be swayed by their stories about how good looking uh, Harding is, and that's going to sway them one way or the other. Or, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they won't kind of fall in line, right? This is a period of really strong political party machines. And the concern was, God, who the heck knows what women are going to do? And the whole electoral system, as far as parties are concerned, is about knowing what voters are going to do, figuring that out and trying uh, to be successful. So the parties and the press decided pretty quickly that they knew how women had voted. So there's the first presidential election in 1920, and by the time we roll around to the second election, presidential election after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, this narrative of failure had become fairly dominant in, cover, uh, in coverage of women voters. Uh, this is maybe the only Saturday scholars this semester uh, in which one of the sites is from Good Housekeeping. Um, I don't know, though. 
Um, so this is a good housekeeping uh, uh, article from 1924. Is women's suffrage a failure? Are women a failure in politics? You're getting the theme. Um, is women's suffrage a failure? Uh, by Charles Edward Russell, a major writer at that time. Um, as someone has said to me at an earlier talk, this would basically be the Twitter hot takes if we had Twitter uh, in 1924, right? So everyone's talking about, boy, women fought so hard to get the right to vote, but it, the, the whole thing didn't really work. So what did they mean when they said failure? They really had two things in mind. Oh, I'm sorry, back it up a slide. Um, what I wanna also say is that this not only was in the press, but became the dominant narrative in academia as well. So this is a early article um, based on the Illinois data I'm gonna talk about later. Um, and the title kind of says it all, American Women's Ineffective Use of the Vote. I can tell you, if you read about how women voted after suffrage in textbooks, in uh, research all through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you follow the sites back, it will eventually land on this article and like a New York Times report from some party leader upstate who said those women didn't vote. Um, that's basically the empirical evidence we have. Um, but this really becomes the conventional wisdom. So when I started this project, I would say to people, well, I'm, I'm studying how women voted after suffrage, and they would say, well, don't we know that already? They didn't. And they, as you'll see in a second, and they voted just, and those who did voted just like their husbands did. So I'm gonna talk in a few seconds about why that claim is problematic. So part one, a failure, women didn't vote. That they'd fought so hard, but that women's turnout was very low, so turnout overall drops in 1920, because of course you expanded the electorate, but a lot of them aren't voting. Um, this was a well-known book about the roaring 20s. The American woman won the suffrage in 1920. She seemed, it is true, to be very little interested in it once she had it. Um, why? Uh, because the ideas of the anti-suffragists had been correct. Women are cons uh, thinking a lot about marriage and men in mustaches, hats, um, <laughs> chocolate, and letters, but they really fundamentally don't think about politics, right? So this is a very old idea. Women's place is in the home, literally. That is women's domain, her arena, and the public world really belongs to men. And so most of the people looking at women's lower turnout in the 20s thought, well, of course, right? That's just, that's not what uh, women naturally do. Um, the other piece of that was the presumption that women mostly voted like their husbands. Um, Overwhelmingly, right, the idea was women are basically doing what they're told. Uh, so this is a headline from the Boston Globe in, in 1920, men reported to be telling women how they ought to vote. Um, this becomes really important. So when George Gallup uh, starts his famous surveys in the 1930s, the earliest survey research we have in the United States, uh, he doesn't actually do a random sample. He does something called quota controlled samples where you're trying to get certain groups. And he, on purpose, undercounted women. And when you asked him why, he said, I don't need to figure out how women are gonna vote. How will women vote on election day? Just exactly as they were told the night before. Right, so there's, they're just doing what their husbands tell them. Now, we might think, well, this is you know, polling and this is newspapers. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to read these slides. If you were lucky enough to be a graduate student in American politics, um, these would all be very famous sources for you. So the first one is a book called uh, voting, uh, one of the very first studies of, uh, kind of empirical studies of voting in the United States. The second one is even more famous. The names Campbell, Converse, Miller, and Stokes are kind of like the four horsemen of American uh, politics. Um, and what they're all basically saying from their surveys was, women don't pay attention to politics, they're not as interested in it, and they basically do what their men tell them to do. So the wife who votes but otherwise pays little attention to politics tends to leave not only the sifting of information to her husband, but abides by his ultimate decision about the direction of the vote as well. That may well have been true. Whether or not these authors, using some of the earliest survey research that we have, were able to show that is a very different question. Uh, I won't go into that in detail, but their read on, as is always true, of the survey research they did have was clearly influenced by their biases. So when women were more likely to say that they talked about politics in their family than men were, which would not surprise us given that men were more likely to be in the workforce and have other opportunities, they read that as women listen to their husbands, not there's an equality or a dialogue sort of happening. And again, that may well have been the case, but we don't really have a lot of empirical evidence uh, to make these sorts of conclusions. So. Women get the vote in 1920, 
pretty quickly we decide women, it just didn't work, it was a failure, um, and it's gonna take a long time for women to really become active in elections. So we wanted to look at women voters after uh, suffrage, and you might be asking yourself, that was 100 years ago. How is it that we don't already know how women voted after suffrage? Well, as many of you who voted in uh, midterm elections just a few days ago might recall, your ballots are not pink and blue. Um, when you send them in or put them in a voting a box, the sex of the voter is not recorded. We, in some places, we have registration information or who voted, but for the most part, election returns cannot tell us how men and women voted separately. For that reason, we really know very little about women voters during this period. Now, the modern solution to that, when you're saying, well, wait, I know so much about how women vote today, is of course the modern political opinion poll. But we're not gonna see reasonably good political opinion polls until the late 1930s, um, some 15 to 20 years after women got the right to vote. So what do we do? That's what we sort of wanted to address in this uh, project. Uh, this cartoon uh, was on the Dallas Morning News on election day in, in 1920. Enter Mr. and Mrs. Voter. Uh, they're both holding ballots. It says, get out of the way, we'll settle this argument. And the floor is things like statistics, estimate, figures. The point is, the idea was women are gonna vote, we're gonna know how it is women vote. But the truth is, we really were not able to find out immediately after those elections. This is the most boring slide I'm gonna to show today, I promise. <laughs> well, you can, afterwards we'll have a vote, and you can tell me, but. Um, so, so what do we do? Um, in a statistical sense, this is known as an ecological inference problem. We have aggregate data, but we wanna know things at a much finer grain. So from the election returns, for all sorts of places, this example is actual numbers from uh, Chicago Ward 27 in 1920, we know how many people voted Democratic, Republican, third party, and didn't vote. They abstained, right? So the election record tells me that for Chicago Ward 27. And then I can go to the US Census and I can find out for Ward 27 how many election aged women, so 21 or plus, and election aged men uh, lived in Ward 27 in 1920. So I got those two pieces of information, but what I want to know is how many women voted Democratic, how many men voted Republican, how many women didn't vote, et cetera. That turns out to be a much harder thing to figure out. Um, again, as I said, that's considered in statistical terms an ecological inference problem, and we take advantage of the fact that there have been major um, advances in that sort of statistical technique um, uh, in the last 25 years. Uh, and so we're able to use basically uh, estimation approaches that weren't really available to scholars until recently to try to go back and look at a very old problem very old sort of puzzle that we weren't able to, to, to answer. Now I could, I already told you this is the most boring, so you know I'm not going to. Um, I could show you lots of statistical results that tried to convince you that this estimation procedure, the thing that we do to figure out how men and women voted in these places works. But my understanding is that there's a pretty strict rule that we have no math before football. So. Um, instead, I'm gonna give you some much more intuitive reason to think that this research that we did uh, makes sense. We're gonna take ex uh, ex uh, advantage of the, what we call the Illinois exception. So remember how I told you that there aren't really pink and blue ballots? That's true, but there are exceptions. So in the years before the 19th Amendment was ratified, um, a number of states granted women the right to vote, but only for a subsection of, of elections. So for example, as early as 1849, Kentucky gave women who were widows and had school-aged children the right to vote in school board elections, right? So you get a say over your child's education, there's no man in the house to give you that say, we will grant you the right to vote. In Illinois, women got the right to vote in presidential elections in 1913, but there was a, sort of aspect of the Illinois state constitution that allowed the state to enfranchise women for certain offices, but not for others. And what that meant is that they had to print different ballots for men and for women. That was actually not that exceptional. In Connecticut, for example, they had separate voting machines for men and for women. But Illinois stands out as the only state, and pretty close the only one in American history, that actually counted and reported men's and women's ballots separately. They did that in 1916, when women had the right to vote for president in Illinois, and they did that in 1920, five weeks after the 19th Amendment was ratified. 
Uh, and that's it. We've got some local races in between, right? And so this is an actual ballot box, ballots for women as opposed to others, um, because there were, in this one exceptional place, uh, separate ballots for men and women. So most of the conclusions that people have drawn about how women voted after suffrage come from Illinois. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Illinois is a very lovely place, as you may be aware. Um, but as we're gonna, one of the things we're gonna show is that the way in which women voted depended a great deal on their context. So knowing how women voted in Illinois actually doesn't tell us that much about how women voted in Virginia or Oklahoma or Massachusetts. And so that's what we're going to look at. So just to give you a sense of what this looks like, I spent one spring break with my husband driving around to all the Ill counties, there are 101 in case you're wondering, counties in Illinois. We did not drive to all 100. Uh, these are the ones where the counties told me, oh sure, we have those old election books, but you'll have to come here and copy them yourselves. And so we were in musty basements. Uh, this is from DeKalb County. Um, there were separate election books for all of the election districts. So this is the Village Hall in Lee. Uh, it, which is election district number two, and you can tell the difference. This is men's, and then the one for women has women at the top, right? So the default is men, and then uh, here's the poll book for women. Uh, a different model, this is Bureau County, Illinois in 1916. These are vote votes for um, people who, uh, electors. So back in the day, you'd actually have the name of the electors on your ballot. Um, these are for Democratic electors, and there's a column here for men and a column here for women. So if you were lucky enough to be a Notre Dame undergraduate uh, about 10 years ago, you would have the great joy of uh, entering in pencil written uh, election returns, sometimes on microfilm, uh, into a big Excel spreadsheet uh, so that we would have this sort of information about how women voted in these places. So let's think about what we have in Illinois. So in Illinois, I have that census data I talked about, about how many men and women were there, and I have overall how men and women voted. I want to know the stuff in the middle, but in Illinois, I actually know the stuff in the middle. So what we did is, in Illinois, we first estimated. We pretended we didn't know that stuff in the middle, because we're not going to know that in any of the other states, and we said, okay, when we use this statistical method, what do we find out? How, what percentage of women vote in each county, or how do women vote overall in Illinois and men vote overall? And then we compared our estimates using that method to what we actually knew about Illinois, and that's what's happening here. So this is how women voted in 1916, men in 16, women 20, men 20, and basically what you're supposed to conclude from this graph is that our estimate, which is right here in the gray, is very, very close to the actual number. We're usually within two or three percentage points, which is, of course, about the kind of confidence interval you're going to have around a regular survey or a poll leading up to elections. So we're not perfect. We, we underestimate women's turnout and overestimate men's pretty similarly. But all of the estimates of how men and women actually voted are within our uh, it's not actually a confidence interval for complicated reasons, a Bayesian credible interval. Um, and so we feel pretty good that this method can let us get pretty close to how men and women actually voted in these elections. So then the goal is, okay, we've got a method that works in Illinois where we can verify it. Let's go apply that to all the other states. So this is a, a glimpse of American politics in 1920s. Um, this was a period of incredible one-partisanship. So there was really no Republican Party to speak of in the American South, and Republicans were really dominant across a great deal of the Midwest, uh, and, and I should say the West as well. It would have been great to be able to do this in all in 1920, 48 states. The problem is that out here in places like Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, Wyoming, they're literally still drawing county lines in the 1920s, right? And so I have election data that's coming from, the, uh, from election records. I've got census data every 10 years. It's virtually impossible to match these things up during this period um, in these states that are, frankly, fairly new as late as 1920. So we end up being able to do this in about 10 states. Um, it is not representative of the entire United States, but we do have um, some variation in the Midwest. We've got some more democratic states in the south and in the border. We've got these sort of northeastern, very strong Republican places in 1920, et cetera. Um, and so while we aren't able to look, do this across every state and we're not even able to do this across a random sample of states, 
this is more information about how men and women voted than we had from Illinois, right? So Illinois tells me how men and women voted in 1916 and 1920. My estimates are gonna tell you how men and women voted in 10 states from 1920 till 1936. So, was women's suffrage a failure? You came here out of the cold to find out if women's suffrage was a failure. And yes, women are far less likely to turn out to vote than are men in these five elections. So the blue is women, the red is men, this is percent turnout, 1920 to 1936. You'll see that both are increasing over time, women a little bit sharper, so they are slowly closing that, but it's going to be very slow. Um, and we've got a gap of about 35 points in that first election. Women are not taking advantage of their new rights. That is the obvious conclusion. But things look a little different when we actually look at the state level. So this is the 10 states in our study arranged from the lowest turnout to the highest. Virginia's here at the bottom with extremely low turnout um, as a result of the fact that this is, of course, a authoritarian regime, non-democratic authoritarian regime in the 20s. There's lots of structures uh, to keep people from voting, um, particularly people of color, but it's important to say that those still, those poll taxes and all the other structures kept a lot of poor whites um, from voting as well, um, through to Missouri and Kentucky. So what explains this variation in turnout and what does it mean for the conclusions we're gonna draw about women uh, in the first elections after suffrage? Well, the first thing to say is there were some places where women got the right to vote and more than half of them showed up at the first election, right? So despite all that socialization, despite all these things, um, women turned out, more than half of women turned out to vote in Missouri and in, in Kentucky in 1920. States that where women had had no right to vote before that. On the other hand, only a little bit more than 20% of women showed up to vote in Massachusetts and Kentucky, in Connecticut in 1920, and fewer than about 6% of women turned out to vote in Virginia. So these were also places where women got the right to the vote for the first time, but they are far less likely to turn out to vote than were their sisters in Missouri and Kentucky. So what makes Missouri and Kentucky different than Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut? I wanna emphasize two things. One is the level of competition. Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut were very uncompetitive places in the 1920s election. So Democrats completely governed the state of Virginia. There's really the actions in primaries. There's not a lot happening in the general election. And so there's very little competition for voters in those sorts of states, right? So when, when you know that one party or the other is going to win, you might think that voters rightfully think, well, it doesn't matter how I vote, they're gonna win anyway. But you'd also gotta think, when and we just saw this in, in, in the midterm elections, when elections are a blowout, people don't invest a lot of time in trying to mobilize people, trying to get out the vote, because even if you got out, you know, 100 more people for your side, you're very unlikely to change the outcome. That's very different in places like Missouri and Kentucky. In Kentucky, the presidential election was decided in 1920 by 0.01% of the vote. Missouri wasn't quite that razor thin, but was also a, a place that not only was competitive in 1920, but had traditionally been more competitive. So there were built up organizations, so both parties competed. So they had an incentive to try and get every vote they possibly could. And it turns out when elections are that close, parties and groups are even willing to try to mobilize women voters. And women voters themselves know that this is a close election. There's gonna be lots of coverage in the press. It's gonna be easy to find out what, who's running for office, uh, where to vote, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, we know that competition uh, has a positive impact on how um, people, oh, I did that one first, we'll go this way. But we're gonna see that it has an even bigger effect on women during this period. So this is showing, uh, the blue is one party Democratic states, red is one party Republican, and then the more competitive states are here in green. For both women and men, the more competitive your states, the South is just distinctly, that's what's here, uh, undemocratic during this period, um, you know, you're gonna get an increase in turnout, always going up. But the difference for men between say one party Republican and competitive is only about 12 points, so it matters doesn't matter a lot. For women, however, it's a 21 point gap. 
The way to think about that is that places that weren't competitive were particularly demobilizing um, for women. That already facing all these other barriers to their voting and social norms and no experience and no practice, when places weren't very competitive and didn't try to get them out to vote, women were more likely to stay home. Now, the other thing that distinguishes these states are what their electoral laws look like. So I already mentioned that this is a period in which um, many states had really restrictive election laws. Poll taxes, um, uh, literacy tests, all the things that I hopefully you've heard of and learned about that were used to discourage particular groups of people from voting. In Virginia, that was, of course, people of color. In Massachusetts and Connecticut, it was all those Irish immigrants uh, that were coming to the United States during this period. So Massachusetts and Connecticut are amazingly um, more than 60% first and second generation immigrant in 1920. And this was of great concern uh, to the traditional political leaders in those states. And so Connecticut has a literacy test, Massachusetts has a poll tax, uh, et cetera. It turns out, and we know this, that everywhere, the more rules you have to discourage voting, guess what, they work. Uh, and so both men and women are gonna be less likely to turn out in places with lots of electoral rules. But again, we're gonna see a bigger impact on women. So the red places are places that only have a requirement that you be a resident, that's pretty common. The blue places are places that have other rules, poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera. So for men, that's a 20% drop off uh, between those two kinds of places. For women, that's a 25 point drop off. And so again, things that discourage voting seem to particularly discourage voting among women. What that means is that we have a really big difference in gender gaps. And our conclusion about whether or not women were willing to vote is really going to differ depending on where we look. So in Connecticut, for example, the biggest turnout gender gap of 41 points. Um, you know, women, uh, men in over 60% of men in Connecticut are voting compared to just over 20% of women. On the other hand, in Missouri, we're going to have a gender turnout gap of just about 24 points. That's a big gap. Not gonna say it isn't, uh, and certainly we would expect that to happen right after a group uh, wins the right to vote, but that's a lot different conclusion than what we might gather from thinking about Connecticut. Illinois here, it has a fairly big gap, but not huge, but doesn't reflect sort of the huge variation. In fact, I'd go even a little farther. So if we were just to look at the gap between women across states, moving from Virginia to Kentucky is a more than 50 point difference. Right? You were more than 50 points more likely to vote if you were a woman in Kentucky than if you were a woman in Virginia. The gap between men and women is only about 32 points, right? So my point is context, where you voted, was actually a bigger impact on whether or not you turned out to vote than whether or not you were a woman. So there's absolutely gender gaps in all these places. But the gap between women in Virginia and women in Kentucky is even larger than we see across men and women in most places. And in fact, as you saw, 41 points is the biggest gender gap uh, in any state, and we're gonna exceed that uh, between women. How about women vote like their husbands? Uh, women, uh, all of whom have been socialized to believe that women uh, do not belong in politics, and politics is the business of men, um, who had been, uh, sort of denied the opportunity to reinforce partisanship and, and party loyalty through repeated voting, mostly in fact, vote a lot like men in the first five presidential elections after suffrage. So again, men in red, women in blue, this is the percent Republican. Um, this was an, a very strong period for Republicans in the 1920s, and both men and women uh, vote very strongly for Republicans. We then have the largest political transformation or electoral transformation in American history with the Great Depression and the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt, and now we've got a population that mostly votes Democratic in 32 and 36, and both men and women make that, make that change. There are, however, small differences, so um, quite small. Women are slightly more Republican during this period and slightly more Democratic during this period. I have a whole other talk about this, but I'll talk a little bit about women being slightly more Republican um, in the 1920s. Again, the story gets more complicated if we look down at our states. So this is our same states uh, set up the same way. Women in blue, percent voting Republican, men in red. In most places, there's not a very big difference between men and women. 
But in the Midwest, so this is Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, and Illinois, places where the Republican Party is really quite strong during this period, women are actually more likely to vote Republican than are men. So the parties had this idea that we won't be able to count on women voters, they'll flake out, they'll do things. We see repeatedly that in the first elections after suffrage, women are actually more loyal to local parties uh, than are men. They're the ones that keep flaking out and going all over the place. I'll show evidence of that in just a second. Um, but women are actually overwhelmingly supporters of the Republican Party, um, where the Republican Party is the strongest. In Virginia, where the Democratic Party is the strongest, and remember this is percent Republican, Women are actually more democratic than our men and statistically significant there as well. So what we see is not so much that women were all Republicans or women were all Democrats, but that if there's any pattern, it's that women tended to be more loyal to the parties nearby. And I can talk a little bit about why that is uh, in the Q&A. Um, and so it's very difficult, and this should absolutely be your takeaway, to talk about women voters. Uh, they're going to look different against all sorts of, across all sorts of demographic groups, and they're even going to look different depending on the context. So uh, where parties are strong, women tend to be more loyal to those specific political parties. What about the progressives? So one of the reasons uh, that many groups mobilized against women voting was that women as a group were so closely associated with the progressive movement. So we've got Housewives Alliance for Proper Inspection of Meat. This is about child labor, Women Trade Union League, and of course, women in prohibition. Um, and so, there, so it's worth saying that one of the biggest funders of anti-suffrage uh, activity were um, uh, alcohol distributors uh, at the end of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. These people knew where their money came from and they feared that women would uh, vote again, would vote for prohibition. Um, and so how do we sort of test this? Does, this? does this activism translate into actual votes? So in 1920, excuse me, 1924, progressives were so dissatisfied with the two choices. Republicans had actually traditionally been the progressive party, but both parties were pretty conservative during this period, that they nominated Robert La Follette, um, a, a, a senator and well-known progressive, as a party candidate. Uh, until Ross Perot, he uh, had the highest vote, like 19% of the vote for La Follette in 1924 of any third party candidate in the 20th century. So, did women turn out in waves for this progressive candidate? Uh, no. They did not. Um, so we don't have any evidence. Uh, the only place it comes even close is Virginia, and these numbers are too small for us to make any sort of generalization. Uh, I kept the span just to give a sense that there was a lot of support, especially in Minnesota, uh, but this is still minority uh, party. Uh, so women were not more likely to defect to progressives. And in fact, in two states, in Kansas and Illinois, we actually find that men were more likely to vote for the third party option than were women. So if anybody was abandoning the parties for some sort of new idea, it, at least in this election and in these states, um, was not women, and in some cases, it was men. So, not giving away the end yet. Was women's suffrage a failure? So it is absolutely true that women's turnout was low and would remain lower than men's. It surpasses men in the 1980s. The gap had mostly been closed uh, by the late 60s and early 1970s. But we see that in places where women didn't face strong uh, electoral laws that barred them from voting or made it more difficult for them to vote, where competition was high, and so there was a lot of information about elections and a lot of incentive for other people to motivate or to mobilize women as voters, women were capable of fairly significant turnout. Uh, we might hit our all-time high or a recent high for turnout in midterm elections uh, this year, uh, but we'll be lucky if that's over 50%. We saw more than 50% of women voting in 1920 in states that were competitive and didn't have a lot of strict election rules. And we see that context seemed to matter more than gender. Where you first voted seemed to be more important to, to determining whether or not you were going to vote or where you first had the right to vote than uh, the fact that you were a woman. We don't see many gender differences in vote choice. And I would point out even today when there's so much talk of the gender gap, um, those gaps between men and women are much smaller than gaps between lots of other groups on the basis of education, on the basis of race, et cetera. That said, uh, women, there is some evidence that women were initially more loyal to local parties and less likely to vote for the progressive party. So the last thing I wanna talk about is in some sense, 
this disconnect between the rhetoric, women's suffrage is a failure, and how women actually voted, you can kind of excuse it in the 1920s. There's, not, there's no polling data. There's, there's no systematic study of women voters and men voters. And so all we can do is sort of look around and make our best guesses and, and try to, to understand what's happening. Of course, today, we have a gazillion polls. I think there's nothing but polls um, sometimes, right, in your news feeds, et cetera. And so we would think that we must be much better in our narratives and the way that we think about women as voters now than we were 100 years ago. But that's not so true either. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about women voters today, we like to talk about moms. Um, and this is, I think, so the book I'm finishing is on this first 100 years. This is one of the most consistent themes across 100 years. The first appeals to women were all about motherhood and education. So the laws that were passed were about maternity care and these sorts of things. And we are still talking about moms. Uh, so since 1996, we've been really interested in this idea of soccer moms, by which we pretty much mean white suburban women with children at home. Okay. Um, but we have war moms. We have security moms uh, since 9-11 in particular, and we're still talking about these. So this is, these are all headlines from 2016. Oh, I did not mean to do that. Uh, why Donald Trump is targeting security moms, how candidates can capture the security moms. These are, again, mostly white suburban women who are very concerned about terrorism and safety. Then we got waitress moms. Uh, this started particularly in 2000. Uh, this is sort of less upper, scale, up, upper middle class women um, who uh, uh, work hard uh, to take care of their families um, and are also seen as an important swing vote. And then, of course, we've even got hockey moms, right? So we just, every woman in politics is a mom of some sort. So what's the problem with that narrative? The problem with that narrative is it really narrows the perceived political interests of women. It's also not particularly accurate. So from 1980 till 2016, this is the percent of all women voters who are white, married, and have children at home. Okay, um, as late as 1980, which is the first year of the modern gender gap, uh, there are still about 30% of women voters. By 2016, fewer than 20% of women who vote fall into exactly those categories. And there's a lot going on there, right? There's the racial and ethnic diversification of the United States. There's um, changes in marital status and marital patterns and, and fertility patterns. A lot of things that are happening that make the modal woman no longer look like these stereotypes that still remain so very popular. Now we are hearing, and this is again happening in the midterms, and I'd be happy to talk about that as well, about certain groups of women. So we, after um, 2016 election, when a majority of women um, cast their vote for the Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, there were all sorts of expressions of shock and dismay. Um, how could women, any women, and white women in particular, vote for a candidate who had been, you know, said such terrible things about women, accused of such terrible things about women, caught on tape saying terrible things about women, et cetera. Again, I think it's important to fall back on the not all women are the same, and that women's gender is not the number one thing determining their vote any more than their gender is the number one thing determining men's vote. So if you think it's shocking that a majority of white women voted for the Republican candidate in 2016, I have news for you. White women have voted a majority for the Republican candidate for president in every presidential election since we started having really good academic polls in 1952. The exceptions are 1964 when everybody voted for Lyndon Johnson. You, of course, all know they were voting against the Republican whose vice president was the only domer ever on a major party ticket. Um, Bombs away, LeMay. Um, and in 1996, when a, uh, a slight majority of white women voted for uh, Bill Clinton's re-election. Partisanship, as we like to say, uh, using technical terms from political science, is a hell of a drug. Um, and we are in a time period, and again, you might not have perceived this, but we're in a time period of really extreme partisanship uh, at the individual level. So in 2016, over 90% of women who identify as Democrats voted for Hillary Clinton, and over 90% of women who identify as Republicans voted for Donald Trump which is pretty much the same rate at which men did the same. And so there are lots of reasons why there are some differences in the partisanship of men and women, but at the end of the day, those sorts of 
of, of loyalties that are tied to all sorts of other forms of identity, racial, economic, education, regional, et cetera, really kick in um, and seem to, whatever, whatever we might think women should vote, and I think it's always problematic to tell people how they should vote, based on their gender, um, there are lots of other characteristics that are coming into play. So I will finish then and be pleased to take your questions. Thank you very much. Yes. So do you have data on the Deep South and the West Coast? In our 20s data? So no, as I was explaining, that the, the kind of data that we need from that period is they're still drawing st like state bear, uh, county uh, borders during that period. So trying to match up election data with Senate, with county, uh, with census data is nearly impossible. Um, there's also not that, so I, you know, you go into it with your like 20th, 21st century point of view. So I was like, well, we have to get California. There's so few people in California, even as late as 1920. Uh, in Wyoming, there's like literally less than 500,000 people. So it just becomes an estimation problem. There's more people living in most of the Chicago wards than in uh, uh, some of these states. Um, now, we've really been pushed on the western part because, of course, women got the vote earliest in those western states. And so if we are able to finish this other book without killing each other, we might try to go back and really... I, I, I spent a whole week in the archives in Oregon um, uh, trying to find more of this sort of data, and it just was impossible. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember the slides correctly, it looked like there was a big jump in turnout in 1928. Yes. Can you speak to that a little bit? I would love to. That is such a great question and a great question on this campus. Um, so uh, 1928 is the Roman religion uh, election. So it's the first election in which Democrats nominate a Catholic for president, Al Smith. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of controversy over prohibition, which of course had been made uh, the law of the land with the 18th Amendment. Um, and Smith, who had been um, governor of New York and sort of fulfilled every sort of ethnic New York stereotype, um, was believed to be in favor of repealing the 18th Amendment, right? So lots of concern about the role of, of alcohol and lots of concerns about religion, all of which are also tied up in all sorts of ethnic and, and power relationships um, as well. And so 1928, it, we have a whole section of the book on this as well, is everybody was like, there's gonna be so many women turning out. This is gonna be the year that, that, men and that, that women turn out because um, there's general expectation, and the evidence suggests this is true, that immigrant women, so women in Boston and, and, and those sorts of places, have been less likely to vote previously, that for social norm reasons and ethnic reasons, et cetera, that most of the turnout of women had been amongst sort of native born white Protestant women in the Midwest. And again, there's some evidence that's true. But everyone thought, my God, you've got Al Smith. He's going to motivate all these immigrant voters. They're going to turn up like they have never before. Um, and then other people said, oh my God, those white Anglo-Saxon Protestant women who fought so hard for temperance and prohibition are going to turn out like crazy as well. The expansion of the electorate in 1928 is one of the largest in American history. There are 25% more voters in 1928 than in 1924. It was massive. And those jumps were just where you'd think they were. Massachusetts and Connecticut, huge numbers. But the truth is, we don't find any evidence that that was a particularly big jump amongst women compared to men. So yes, 1928 was very mobilizing for a lot of people. Uh, and again, particularly uh, uh, European immigrants on the East, uh, East Coast and places like Chicago. Um, but it seemed to be equally mobilizing for both men and women. Um, yeah, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yes. Uh can you speak to the 21st century, some of the trends in women crossed over uh, with women voting? So that in what, in women voting crossover? Oh, sure. So I thought people might be interested. Um, most of the data I have is on midterms, not pres I mean, I have the presidential stuff, um, but I'm gonna show you, well, I mean, this is to simply show, this is the percent of women voting for Donald Trump. This is the percent of men. That's in 1916. That's what it looked like in 2012. You know, and the most scandalous thing Mitt Romney said about women was something about binders. Um, this is to make the point that, of course, race is a much bigger determinant, although there are gender gaps across all groups. So this is white women and white men in 12 and 16, black women and black men, Latino women, 
and Latina men. But what I really want to show you, I can talk about that in a second. Um, this is US House vote by gender in midterm elections. From uh, And I should give a shout out to a political scientist by the name of Brian Schaffner, who I don't think slept last week. Um, and, and, and really dug into this, the data as quickly as possible. So um, what you're seeing is what is considered the modern gender gap, which is women more in favor of left parties. We see that around the world. Um, from 2008 till 2018, uh, and this is a two-party Democratic share of House votes. So it's not presidential. We're just trying to look at what's happening in the House. So there's consistently a gender gap where women are more likely to vote Democratic. And of course, both men and women moved Democratic on Tuesday, but our initial evidence is that women moved more. So why might that be? Um, we see it across age groups. So this is 18 to 39s, 40 to 49s. There's a reason for this. 50 to 64 and 65 plus showing the vote. And of course, um, younger voters are uh, across those same years. Younger voters always more democratic. Um, in general, the older you get, the more likely you are to vote Republican. We see that dramatically so uh, here in 2018. But you're going to see that women sort of pop up a bit. I mean, dramatically so here more than men do, maybe not amongst the oldest voters, maybe not amongst here, but we do see that, right? So still driven a lot by young women, became much more democratic in this election. But what we've definitely seen in recent years is a growing and a different uh, gap based on education. Um, so traditionally, when I was in graduate school 25 years ago, it, like the idea that more education leads to more Republican voting was like one of the Ten Commandments. If you ran your data and that result didn't come up, I, and I'm being completely serious, my advisor would say, well, go, you did something wrong. <laughs> you coded it wrong. Go back. There's no control. There's nothing you can do to shake more education, more Republican voting. That, however, has not been true uh, in the last 10 years. So this is the House vote amongst white voters. Uh, education works a little bit different in, in other groups. Um, and again, here's college-educated women at the top uh, voting Democratic in House elections. This is college-educated men. This is uh, non-college-educated women. And this is uh, non-college-educated men. So yes, non-college-educated women went a bit towards the Democrats in 2018. But this is where the action is. Um, and we see the biggest change. College-educated women, while still um, voting you know, more Democratic, like other college-educated men, are I mean, this gap amongst college-educated is much bigger. And that's also traditionally different. It used to be that the bigger gender gaps were amongst those with less education. Um, that's become the gap in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and they were already way more Democratic than men, and they became much more Democratic than men in 2018. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question, and then I'm going to show one more piece of data about that flipped women from voting primarily Republican to voting primarily Democratic? That's a great question. So um, the discovery of the gender gap, literally the, the name, um, came after the election of 1980. Um, and because that was the first election in which we saw, not first, it was the first election where we saw and we made a big deal about um, a higher percentage of women voting Democratic than men, it was also the first election in which the Republican and Democratic Party push themselves away on women's rights issues. So the, my first book that um, was, being, was about sort of how that happened. So Republicans had been for the ERA since the 1940s, uh, you know, had not really taken an official position on abortion, which was a fairly new issue as late as 1980. Um, Democrats had opposed the ERA. They blocked it in the Senate. Um, they had also not taken a position yet on abortion. 1980 changes all that. So the platforms from then on out are Republicans very strongly pro-life, um, uh, boot the Equal Rights Amendment out, are, you know, don't like affirmative action, don't like government support for childcare, et cetera. Well, of course, Democrats move in a different way. That was a new thing in 1980. And because those two things came at the same time, there's this popular idea that that's what did it, right? So women care about these things, except for that's not at all supported by the empirical evidence. So men and women's preferences on those sorts of issues are really not that different. And there's not a lot of evidence that women care about those issues more or prioritize them more in their voting. 
The other thing, of course, that happened in the 1980s is that the party's general distinction on social welfare issues, how big the government should be, what the safety, social safety net should look like, expand, had expanded obviously since the New Deal, particularly under Johnson with Great Society, and then of course that's really Ronald Reagan's whole brand, right, with smaller government, et cetera. And women generally tend to be more in support of a stronger social welfare state. Some people would say that's because women are naturally more compassionate. Some people would say we've also racialized our social uh, uh, safety net and women are more egalitarian. Both of those things are true, again, on average. It's also the case that um, particularly beginning in the late 70s, women were not only more likely, of course, to take advantage of social welfare policies, but changes in the economy and women's role in the economy had made women more vulnerable. So if all these women who move into the, in, the workforce in the 60s and 70s, if you're the first in, you're the first out. Um, they, you know, we're not going to invent the term social, uh, sexual harassment until the 70s, right? So, so women, yes, become more economically independent, and that's useful, but they also become in some ways more economically vulnerable, especially right away. And so the better explanations, I think, of that Oh, well, let me say one more thing. And as the social welfare state had expanded in the 60s and 70s, women take a lot of those jobs. So who depends on the state for employment? School teachers, nurses, social workers, all of which are occupations where there are a lot of women in them. And so their sort of view of whether or not we should cut government programs probably looks a little bit different on average. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to show sort of one more thing. Um, So um, one of the things I try to help my students understand is that when we talk about gender, of course, we don't just mean men and women. We mean ideas about gender, about appropriate gender roles, et cetera. So one of the things that we learned in analysis of the 2016 election is that while dissatisfaction with the economy did have an effect on Trump votes, so the more dissatisfied you were, the more likely you were to vote for Donald Trump. But much more strongly were the impact of racism and sexism. And again, that is not to say that everyone who voted for Donald Trump was racist or sexist. It is to say that if you expressed racist views, you were much more likely to vote for Donald Trump than if you did not. So let me be 100% clear about what I'm saying. Lots of non-racist, non-sexist people voted for Donald Trump. But if you did hold those views, you were more likely to do so. The question is whether or not Donald Trump's particular politics then affects the party as a whole. So what this is showing is from um, the least racist to the most racist to the least sexist to most sexist. Um, the dark one is the effect on Donald Trump vote, and you really can't even see the gray one here, which is the impact on House vote in, uh, in 2016 because they really run together. So um, both parties, uh, both vote for House candidate, Republican House candidates and for Donald Trump became more likely as you became uh, more racist, and I can talk about how that's measured. We didn't see that with sexism. So going from least sexist to most sexist made you more likely to vote for Donald Trump. Excuse me, go back. But it did not affect whether or not you voted for a Republican House candidate. That's going to change in 2018. So in 2000, this is um, the impact of racism from least to most on uh, red is going to be the House vote in 2018. Gray or blue is going to be the House vote in 2016. They look exactly the same. So the effect of racism on voting for Republicans in the House in 2016 and 2018 is the same. This is the effect of sexism or voting for Republican House candidates uh, in 2016. This is the effect of sexism in voting on Republican House candidates in 2018. And I'm saying this because someone asked about women uh, and why we see that big jump in 2018. What's important to see here, well, let me say two things that are important to see here. One is women are perfectly able to express sexist views. And so the idea that this is just all men is absolutely not true. So the kinds of questions that we now ask to measure either hostile, what we would call hostile or benevolent sexism are women complain too much, women get advantages, women falsely accuse men, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And lots of women are willing to uh, agree with those statements. The problem for the Republican Party is the most sexist voters are equally likely to vote for Republican House candidates in both 2016 and 2018. The least sexist voters have become much less likely to vote for Republican House candidates. 
And so the problem for the Republican Party is Donald Trump's brand, this is always what happens with presidents, is coming to affect his party as a whole. And voters who are the least sexist are becoming increasingly uncomfortable with voting for Republican House candidates. And I'll leave it with that. Any other questions? I know we're getting to the end of time and there are... Oh, very good. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much.